to find, locate, identify, document the whole field of debris. That's a very important thing that people should keep in mind. I'm working on it and um, I am hopeful that the truth will uh, appear soon. I don't think we will find the plane, but I think we will find the truth. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> 40 minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. o'clock Saturday night that was the woke that was we've got Pete Barnes we've got Lewis Perry and we've got the author of gender madness of London and we've got someone I don't like morning how are you this morning it's Christo here on talk TV thanks for your company this morning um, lots that we've got to discuss between now and seven o'clock. We'll try and keep some of it light-hearted because what a grim 24 hours since you and I last spoke. I mean, absolutely dreadful. Yesterday, we had such fun on the programme. You know, sometimes you just sort of throw it all out the window. 
the running order and you know you talk about some of the serious stories around but it was so light-hearted and then what happens it's absolutely awful what we've seen in the last 24 hours. We've seen Iran and Israel and the just horrible, horrible, awful situation there. We've also, very, very shortly after we came off air, uh, we started to hear about the absolutely dreadful events in Sydney. We're going to be crossing live to Sydney, actually, in about 20 minutes' time. And we will be discussing um, there uh, the latest from the city and exactly what happened in that shopping centre attack in Bondi, which is uh, uh, just, uh, you know, somewhere that I've been, somewhere that so many people here in the UK uh, have been. So we'll talk about that. Uh, we've got our Right Royal Roundup as well. That'll lighten things, hopefully, a little bit. Um, pressure building on Angela Rayner this morning. What should she do next? Well, we'll get your opinions on that as well. Really interesting story as well um, regarding terror attacks this morning. Uh, the Manchester Arena bombing. Well, those victims directly affected either people who were involved in it or who lost family members apparently are suing MI5, saying, look, you knew that this person you know, was potentially able to carry out this attack. It is down to you. We're suing you. So very interested to know what you think about that and about whether you should be able to sue the authorities if they didn't act quickly enough when it comes to a potential terror attack. Uh, we'll talk more about manners. We mentioned these yesterday. There's actually a story about manners this week. And, well, we'll find out whether your team, Amanda... Or Team Sharon. This is, of course, the feud between Amanda Holden and Sharon Osborne. We've got Paul Britton, who is a leading criminal defence lawyer. He will be here as well, looking at the newspapers. We'll find out his view, especially on the Angela Rayner story as well. So lots for us to discuss between now and 7am. It's Christo and it's early breakfast. Oh, I tell you, I need this this morning. What a grim 24 hours. I'm so sorry that it has just been um, awful, really, hasn't it? So just the world situation just is on a knife edge, isn't it? With what's happening with Iran launching these attacks on Israel, saying that they're retaliating for what Israel did when it came to the the uh, uh, embassy in Syria. So that is a really, really awful situation. As always, look, we're going to keep an eye on it. We're not going to actually discuss it in depth this morning. Uh, I know that it will be covered in breakfast. I know that it's going to be covered throughout the day. Of course, if something significant happens in the next couple of hours, we will, of course, bring it to you here on Talk TV. But uh, it just all we know at the moment is this, this drone attack has been launched and uh, Israel have been uh, defending themselves and the US has vowed ironclad commitment to Israel's security and the RAF are assisting Israel uh, to defend itself from these drones. Uh, meanwhile, the Prime Minister has condemned in the strongest terms the Iranian regime's attacks against Israel. So we have that story which is developing. As I said, we'll keep an eye on it, but uh, we're not going to go into it in depth this morning. Meanwhile, we've got the story in Sydney as well. What has gone on in the last 24 hours? That Sid Sydney story is just the most heinous, horrific situation that has been taking place. This is, of course, this knife attacker who just seemingly went on this rampage in a shopping centre. It was the uh, Westfield shopping centre. Uh, it was actually... I mean, uh, it, it, it's 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 uh, as horrific as it is, um, and we're showing you some photos of this this attacker on on the screen at the moment as he went on this uh, rampage. Um, we're not sure at the moment of the complete story as to how this happened. Uh, we'll find out a little bit more in about uh, twenty minutes' time when we cross live to Sydney. When I first saw on X, actually, it was as I was on my way home yesterday morning and I was uh, on Twitter X Twitter X as I call it now because I don't know what to call it now um, at the moment it looks like seven people are dead in this attack we didn't know much yesterday morning 
um, we think it might be six, we think it might be um, seven. Differing stories still coming out uh, regarding the authorities on that. Um, six confirmed, some places saying seven. Um, and when I saw Westfield, I mean, as terrible as it is in Sydney, my heart sank because, of course, Westfield, if you're living here in London, you, was, you, you associate with London. A big Westfield shopping centre in West London. Um, there are, I think there's one in East London as well and one in South London. So I immediately thought, oh, my word. And then you realise, of course, that Westfield is an Australian brand and that was where it was taking place. Absolutely dreadful. Many of us have been to Bondi. Many of us are really familiar with that part of the world. I don't know if you've ever been to Australia. I absolutely adore Australia. It's one of my favourite, favourite places in the world. I, I talk about it so often about wanting to go back there and knowing that this has happened to Australia is just awful. Absolutely awful. Very, very rare that things like this happen in Australia. I think it's fair. To say, As I say, we'll get a little bit more on this in about 20 minutes time. But uh, as we say, we think it's six people. Some places reporting seven people um, stabbed to death in this Westfield shopping centre. Uh, the attacker was shot dead by a police officer. Numerous people injured. The most horrific story of a mother who didn't survive her, uh, her injuries, saving her baby. Some still in a critical condition and attacker shot dead. This awful story of the nine-month-old baby who is in a critical condition. Um, New South Wales Police Commissioner saying in a press conference on Saturday evening the attacker was a 40-year-old man yet to be formally identified but didn't believe his motive was related to terrorism. I mean, uh, what can you say? What can you say? They think it's mental health reasons. I mean, of course, more will come out about that. Um, some people as well, slightly cynical of those explanations that you hear regarding mental health and whether it's something to do with terror. But again, we just need to uh, uh, wait to see what happens. But um, yeah, really, really awful situation as well. Hey, talking of awful situations, things haven't got easier. For Angela Rayner this morning as well. So much that we can talk about this morning, you and I. Um, now, apparently, um, her own former aides are saying that she's lying about where it was that she was living. This is Matt Finnegan, who is Ms Rayner's former chief advisor, has given a statement to Greater Manchester Police in which he states that her actual home was with her husband not the former council house where she was registered on the electoral roll. You can't be registered on the electoral roll somewhere you're not living because that is something that she is accused of. Again, she denies any impropriety, but that is taken very, very seriously. Police announced on Friday they're investigating these claims that Ms Rayner breached electoral law by registering a former right-to-buy council house and... Um, basically uh, registering that address to vote in whilst living with her husband whom she had just married. So it's all very, very murky, these particular uh, uh, situations, because who doesn't live with their, with their husband when they first marry them? Who marries someone and lives in a different house for five years but then tweets that they're at home with their husband? It's very, very murky. Um, she's responded to police statements saying that she would step down if she was found to have committed a criminal offence. But yesterday we spoke about whether that was hypocritical, didn't we? Because she was calling for, you know, for, for baying for blood when the Conservatives were being investigated by the police. And I think she was probably fair in saying that if you're being investigated by the police, at the very least you should sort of stand down from perhaps your front bench duties. If you're a constituency MP, perhaps you should continue with that. But... Very, very strange situation. There's no doubt in my mind, according to this aid, that this was Ms Rayner's family home. So very, very odd that this is the situation that she is uh, facing. Uh, the male, unsurprisingly, really going for this. 
Sorry, just finishing my tea this morning. Very rude. Apologies. Manners. Um, we'll talk about those later as well, by the way. I've just broken my own manners. Uh, Rainergate, they've said, unanswered questions. Um, they're really going for it, the mail on this story. Did Angela Rayner break the Representation of the People Act by putting on the electoral roll that her home was in this council house in Vicarage Road when she was actually living with her husband? She's accused of avoiding capital gains tax on the sale of that house because if she's not living in it, then it is something that is subject to capital gains tax, as we discussed last week. If it's a, a rental property, then essentially it's, it's, it's not an asset that you are excused of capital gains tax when you sell it. So this is a tax on profit when anyone sells an asset that's increased in value, though it's not liable on the sale of a main home. Well, if she's living with her husband, could it have been her main home? And when you have a, when you are married, you can't have two main homes. And so it, that's a bit murky. Council tax, she got a council tax discount on that home because it's apparently living there on her own. You get a single person's discount. Well, should she have got that discount or not? And also perjury and fraud, they're saying. They're really going for it. If she was found to have lived there, then she could face charges under the Fraud Act, which came into force under Labour in 2006, regarding false representations for lying about her address. And uh, Labour's deputy re-registered the births of her two younger children um, in the husband's address. But testimonies from neighbours and Rayner's social media posts from the same time suggest the latter address was her home, this, this husband's address. Under the Act, anyone providing false information is guilty of an offence. So, very, very strange situation, this one. If she didn't live in Vicarage Road, which is the council house, she might have committed an offence under perjury. It's illegal to make a false statement with intent to have the same inserted in any register of births and deaths. I mean, they really are going for it, aren't they? Um... So that's Angela Rayner's situation uh, today. I think it's fair that she's got to answer these questions. So I don't understand the people that are saying that she can't and that she shouldn't. She's got to answer the questions. But I still don't understand how you can live in two places at the same time. That's, it's very murky. Very, very murky indeed. So not a great morning for her. Some of the other front pages as well. Oh, interesting story yesterday as well. I don't know if you saw this. Um, oh, morning to Dawn. Dawn Neeson's up this morning. You can see that she's talking about cocktails. Um, and have we sent the tweet out yet? Oh, I don't think he sent it out. 17 minutes past five. Can we get it out, please? Thank you. Sun on Sunday. Um, they've gone for showbiz this morning. Did you see this? This was all happening within a few minutes of the show ending yesterday morning. Do you know what? I'll tell you what. It's because Sharon Osborne probably listens to this programme and that was when she decided that she wanted to send this tweet. But uh, apparently uh, there's a feud going on between Amanda Holden and Sharon Osborne. So Sharon Osborne... Uh, so, OK, let me give you the whole history. Uh, have we sent it now? He doesn't know what happened. He was caught chatting to someone. Uh, OK. Um, Sharon Osborne, Louis Walsh in the Big Brother house. Do you remember that? When they were in the Celeb Big Brother house? And I have to say they were brilliant in the Celeb Big Brother house because all they did was trash talk people. And as you know, I do love a bit of that. My mother always says, if you haven't got anything nice to say, go and sit next to Christo. And I absolutely agree. So Sharon Osborne was rightly slagging off Simon Cowell because Simon Cowell um, offered her a job on X Factor. Um, she turned down a job in the States to do The Masked Singer and then dropped her from The X Factor and she was really, really angry about that. And they were sort of slagging off the format of the show. And as you know, Louis Walsh slagged off everyone when he was in there, slagged off Ronan Keating, uh, slagged off Jed Wood, slagged off lots and lots of people. Um, so it was quite interesting. It was quite, I tell you what, it was quite refreshing. Because you know what showbiz is like. Everyone sort of air kisses and best friends. But you know deep down half the people hate each other. 
Um, so it was refreshing to have that honesty. Anyway, then Amanda Holden goes on to then give an interview where she talks about people being ungrateful to Simon Cowell and saying, look, Simon Cowell gave you your career. She doesn't mention Sharon Osbourne or Louis Walsh by name, but she says she talks about how ungrateful certain people are, right, and sort of alludes to the fact that these people were given their career by Simon Cowell and that they should be more grateful, they should be more humble. Well, Sharon Osbourne reads this interview in the mail, hits the roof, and sends this open letter on, on X, Twitter, to Amanda Holden, saying, listen, darling, <laughs> I think it's me you're talking about in the mail. Just so you know, Simon Cowell didn't give me my career like he did you. Just so you know, I'm an international brand. I'm well known all throughout the world. And you're not. Um, you may choose, I mean, it's so scathing, you may choose to do a little bit of radio or some pantomime, but I don't. Um, I was living in an LA mansion before you were even born, dear. The money I got from Simon Cowell shows, which is way more than you get, Amanda, I spent on a few handbags. Um, and essentially, I've managed stadium filling artists, Grammy award winning artists. I won an Emmy award as the, as the producer of, of, of the Osbournes. My husband has sold 170 million albums um, and has been in, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, and if it weren't for me, Simon Cowell actually needed me for his shows because I added credibility due to my managing management career over the years. Perhaps you weren't educated enough to know this, but now you do. Um, you know, and, and, and toodle pip. So this is now the feud that is going on, which I think I've become obsessed with. And I think now Amanda Holden has responded. So, so um, Amanda dis saying dissing Simon is bitter and pathetic, like Cinderella with her two sisters. And Sharon says, Amanda, you'll never be in my league. You've picked the wrong, ugly stepsister. And now Amanda Holden has been backed by Simon Cowell. Do you know, I've never warmed to Amanda Holden. I'm sure she's nice. Um, I interviewed her once and actually she was lovely. So maybe I'm being a bit, a bit harsh. It's a shame when you see two women who are actually very successful sort of going at it like this. But of course the tabloid's going absolutely crazy about it. I'm not sure if we've heard anything from Amanda since then, um, but it's a showbiz row that has become bitter, pathetic, and all those sorts of things, and I'm absolutely living for it. So that's what's going on in The Sun on Sunday. So that's a slightly more light-hearted story, and maybe this morning that's something that we need. Coming up, we're going to be crossing live to Sydney to find out the latest from that city. We're going to talk about terror, actually. Uh, again, just to reiterate, we don't know that that's the reasoning behind what's happened in Sydney, but very interesting front page on the Sunday Times this morning. Arena bomb survivors sue MI5. That's going to be an interesting legal story. We'll talk to Paul Britton about that a little later on, and uh, lots more besides, including Kinsey's Right Royal Roundup. So we'll get to all of that coming up next, right here live on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Quite right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. 
That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Morning, Christo here on Talk TV. Coming up, we're going to be uh, having our Right Royal Roundup. Uh, Kinsey's one today, a little bit later uh, this morning, because, of course, other events have taken priority. And uh, we're going to be talking uh, about those in just a moment. We'll cross live to Sydney. Coming up, we'll talk about that story this morning as well, about those victims of the Manchester terror attack here in the UK, uh, whether they should be allowed to sue MI5. So we'll talk about that some more. Uh, later, we'll lighten the mood. We'll talk about manners a bit. And we might talk about this showbiz feud between Amanda Holden and uh, Sharon Osbourne as well. So it's not all doom and gloom. But my word, the last 24 hours has been, um, of course, some doom and gloom. Iran launching these drone attacks on Israel. Again, we're keeping an eye on that story for you. But also this horrific story coming out of Sydney, where uh, at the moment we'll find out the confirmed number in a moment, but uh, it's being reported that it's six people killed in this major attack in the Westfield shopping mall, which is in the Bondi area of uh, Sydney. Uh, let's now cross live to a journalist at 2GB in Sydney. Olivia Whitbury joins us live here on Talk TV. Uh, morning to you, Olivia. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us this morning. Hi, Christo. Thanks for having me. So what is the latest, firstly, that you can tell us uh, from your city regarding casualties? Well, firstly, what do we know what happened uh, that happened? And, 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 and what is the latest you can tell us on, on casualties and victims? So at this point, there are six confirmed victims. Uh, the majority of them were wo women, one man among them. There's three people in critical condition still in hospital, um, but 12 people in hospital in total. Um, and the offender was also shot dead by an extremely brave police officer at the scene. And for those people who perhaps don't know, what was the train of events? What actually happened in this shopping centre? So yesterday afternoon, around 3 p.m., uh, Saturday afternoon, uh, the 40-year-old offender, Joel Couchy, entered Bondi Junction Westfield Shopping Centre, which is an extremely busy, extremely popular shopping centre on a Saturday afternoon, first day of school holidays here in New South Wales. So a lot of people would have been out with their kids, going to the movies, shopping, doing grocery shopping. And at 3 p.m., the offender entered the shopping centre armed with a 30-centimetre knife 
and went on a rampage where he stabbed multiple people uh, on various levels. It's a five level shopping center plus multiple levels of car parks underneath. And he uh, systematically went through and stabbed multiple people before an extremely brave female police officer, Inspector Amy Scott, uh, ran in and um, asked him to drop the weapon. He refused. And then she shot and uh, killed him. Um, however, after she shot him, she immediately commenced CPR to try and save his life and then jumped into action to help CPR on other victims as well. I mean, we're hearing, and again, I know these figures can be a, a, a little sketchy even at this stage, but, but uh, at least 17 people were stabbed. Um, and one of the most heartbreaking stories, I'm sure you can relay this to us, is of um, a mother who is one of the victims who sadly lost her life, but in the final moments of her life, um, managed to save her baby. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so it's a really incredible story of um, bravery and selflessness. Among the victims uh, was the mother that you spoke about, a 38-year-old woman named Ashley Good, a first-time mother. She was out shopping with her nine-month-old baby, Harriet, who was in a pram. Uh, the offender ran up to the pram and stabbed the baby horrifically in the stomach and then began stabbing Ashley. Um, but she managed to uh, pick up the baby and she passed it over to two brothers. She begged them to take care of the baby. Um, unfortunately, her wounds were extremely horrific and she later passed away in hospital. She was taken to hospital in critical condition, as was her poor little baby. And the baby has since undergone surgery and is um, doing better. She's still in a stable, a serious but stable condition. But um, the last final moments, I guess, of Ashley's life were understandably devoted to her daughter, Harriet, and just trying to get anyone, strangers to her, to take her little nine-month-old baby and try and save her. It's, it's, you can't get your head around that, can you? Well, I, I, you I don't, really it, it, It's unbelievable. Um, you know, actually having been a victim of the stab wounds herself and the final yeah. act of her life to pass her baby to someone so that her baby was um, saved. And and uh, thank goodness, firstly, that, that the baby has survived, that Harriet survived and, 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 and is hopefully going to recover from her injuries. But my word, that... that when you were describing it, it sends chills down your spine, doesn't it? It really does. And the, the great bravery of those two men, two brothers who um, quickly took the baby and they have told other media outlets that they use shirts, just anything they could find to try and stop the bleeding on the baby and also to try and help the mother at the same time. But they, you know, took the baby from her and made sure it got the appropriate medical care. And at the same time, that this was all still unfolding. Like, they didn't know if there was only just one attacker or if there are others in the shopping centre. They didn't know where the attacker was or if he could come back um, or even the motivation behind the attack. And it's just one of many stories of bravery and courage that we've seen. There was also another man who used a bollard at the top of an escalator to try and stop the offender gaining access to a floor above. Another amazingly brave individual. Um, but the moment, I mean, was it just from what we know, completely indiscriminate or because I, I'm looking here that we've got sort of four women that were victims, a man aged in his his 30s, they, they were the five that, that died in the shopping centre. I understand someone else uh, died later, but was it just indiscriminate from what we know? Was it just literally anyone that this person encountered he was attacking? Yes, so um, police are still trying to find a motivation. Um, we understand this person, this 40 year old man from Queensland originally, who only moved to Sydney about a month ago, had a history of mental illness. Uh, there are reports that he was diagnosed with schizophrenia as a teenager and reports are starting to emerge about um, him having a fascination with knives and that sort of thing. But all of this is obviously still to be investigated. Um, you're right, All the majority of the victims were female. Um, three of them have been identified. Another victim was 25-year-old Dawn Singleton, who is the daughter of a man called John Singleton, who is a, um, quite a well-known uh, media personality and media owner um, in Australia. 
But yes, the majority were female with the exception of one man in his 30s, uh, who we believe was a security guard. So I guess the motivation there remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned motivation um, and you obviously mentioned the, the context of, of the mental health issues of this person. Um, so police, I understand, they ruled out that they think that this is uh, some sort of ideological attack, some sort of terror related attack. It, 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 is that is that right? Is that is that what they've said so far? Yes, they don't believe it was terror related. Um, and the New South Wales Police Commissioner Karen Webb has repeatedly said at a couple of media conferences over the last 24 hours that they don't believe it was related to an ideation or an ideology. However, she was asked an interesting question this morning at a media conference about if the majority of the victims were female and this was targeted towards women, at what point that becomes an ideology? She said it's too early to tell at this stage. Yeah, and but I think, sorry, do go the on. Remaining, yes, sir, even the remaining victims in hospital, um, those still recovering, three of whom are critical, that the majority of them are women as well. Yeah, so it's a very, very interesting statement to make. And I wonder whether there, well, I, like, I lived in Australia for a while. I absolutely adore your country. My heart goes out to 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 Australia at the moment. Um, but also I, I have absolute confidence in your resilience um, as a nation. But I wonder if knowing your media, whether some of those questions will now still need to be answered about to what extent this will be an ideological attack. And I wonder whether that will be revised going forward. So we have these victims in hospital at the moment. We know, uh, uh, like you say, that, that, that they're getting the best medical care, but but do we know how many there are and, and, and the prognosis? Uh, as of this morning, there were 12 people still in hospital, uh, three of them critical. Um, and the majority of them, uh, the other ones are either serious or stable, but we don't know much more than that. And how is Sydney? I mean, again, I, I just alluded to it. Brilliant, brilliant, wonderful place. Bondi, I mean, full of all sorts of different people. Bondi, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's sort of the beach resort of Sydney. Would that be a, a fair fair way of describing it so a lot of people who are backpackers a lot of people from different nations a lot of people who are Australian love living there um how is Bondi and Sydney and Australia as a whole reacting to this I think that's a very fair statement when you think of Australia I think a lot of people think of Bondi Beach and the sunshine and you know the glamorous beaches um in the eastern suburbs but you know it's been a really shocking and um unfathomable thing for Sydney. When this started, the news of this started to emerge yesterday, um, I was actually at the races and no one could believe that something like this could happen in Sydney. It's so incongruous that, you know, a mass casualty event like this, it just, it doesn't happen in Australia. We just don't, we don't even think about that as a risk when you leave the house each day, let alone in a shopping centre where, you know, people take their families every day, every weekend, you know, Bondi Junction is full of families and full of young people just trying to have a good time. It's just not something that's at the forefront of our minds as Australians that an event like this could happen and it's really sent shockwaves around the country. Um, the Premier, Chris Minns, was actually on the first day of his holiday, he had uh, flown out to Japan but quickly made a U-turn and didn't even leave the airport actually, came straight back to Australia. And our Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has also attended the scene a short time ago to lay flowers as well. So we're all in a state of shock. We all, especially in Sydney, people feel that could that could have been us. We could have been there that day. Was this attacker known to the authorities? He was known to police in Queensland, where he was originally from. He's from uh, the town of Toowoomba orig originally. That's where his family still live. Um, I've read that he was variously living in Brisbane and the Gold Coast before moving to Sydney a month ago. He was briefly known to authorities, but apparently not of any um, significant consequence. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this question, but obviously you've been reporting on this, Olivia. How are you? Yes, I mean, I, you know, in comparison to those who were there yesterday and the trauma that 
the people who were in the shopping centre at the time and the family and loved ones and friends of those who, who have unfortunately lost their lives or are in hospital currently. I mean, I think um, we're all just, our hearts and minds and thoughts are completely with them. We all just want to see the quick recovery, especially of baby Harriet, but of everyone who was impacted by this. And I think we're all, you know, shaken and a little shocked. And a part of us now thinks, well, is Sydney not the safe place we thought it was? Is If something like this could happen at Bondi Junction, where else could it happen? Yeah. So, that's the overwhelming feeling across Sydney today. Well, listen, I, I like I said, I, I adore Sydney. Um, I spent many, many months uh, of my happiest times in your city. I think your country is 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 absolutely amazing. It's resilient, and as tragic and as horrific as this is, and as as important as it is to acknowledge. Um, the victims and I thank you so much as well for naming so many of them because I think in so many of these reports sometimes the names get forgotten um, I am absolutely sure that the that Sydney and the resilience of of people who live there and across Australia I think that that, that you will bounce back eventually for this after a period of acknowledgement and healing I, I really hope so because of what an amazing city and what an awful thing to happen to you. Um, we send our love and condolences, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us uh, this morning, Olivia. Thank That's you. Olivia Whitbury, who is a journalist at 2GB in Sydney. What unbelievable and horrific chain of events. Uh, listen, we're going to take an early break, and then when we return, uh, we'll have our right royal roundup. We'll lighten the mood a little here, all on Talk TV. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey. Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Either way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Was supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Uh, so let's get right to it. And uh, of course, a little bit later this morning, but let's get you up to date with Kinsey's Right Royal Roundup. Kinsey's Right Royal Roundup. Um, thanks for waiting, uh, Kinsey. I know that, that that we're coming to you late this morning. Really appreciate it. We needed to get that, that obviously, that report from um, Sydney and those horrific events. Let's lighten the mood a little bit and talk about some uh, royal news this morning. And um, uh, well, let's start with a nice story. I mean, I know we talked about it last week. I know it's not on your list, but I, I think it's... Uh, I, I loved uh, Queen Camilla's present to King Charles for their anniversary. I don't know if you saw what it was, but it, it was the money with his face on it. So, oh, here you go. Look, here, here are the banknotes with your face. That's a good anniversary present, isn't it? I think that they both just... Um, I mean, they constantly prove why... And I am a huge Diana fan, but that they are the... They are a great love story, and they are truly meant to be with each other, and they share a sense of humour, which is something that... Diana had an incredible sense of humor and in uh, there's an entire wall in Vegas at um, this museum for Diana where they have obtained these greeting cards that she sent people and the greeting cards are hilarious and both of her sons have talked about receiving these inappropriate cards at school but it's definitely not the king's sense of humor. Um, I think that the king and, and Queen Camilla have a very a unique sense of humor that they, and it's, it's almost like a, a secret language that they share with one another and um you know i do think that ultimately they were meant to be together and you see that in the way that they engage with each other sort of awkwardly you've been to that diana museum haven't you oh yeah i almost wore a shirt from it tonight i don't <laughs> i just i didn't though of course you've been to that diana museum i, don't, I would I, I would be i've been horrified had you told me you'd not been i just i don't know what you were just saying though i just sort of flashed into my mind i wonder if Diana was still alive today, and I don't know, maybe she'd have remarried. I wonder if if the four of them would have ever found some peace enough to have been able to, to I don't know, share King Charles's birthday or, 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 you know, to have been able to go to family events and, and it all been OK. Well, I know that uh, I truly believe that towards the end of her life, she had become closer to Ch Prince Charles at the time. Um, they I've told this story to you before, but I, I have it in my book, Ours for Revenge Dress, when he asks if he could stop by Kensington Palace to use the loo. And as he he stops into Kensington Palace, uses the restroom, and as he's leaving, Diana chased him out and said in front of all of his guards and everyone there waiting for him, same time next week, and winked at him. And he, you know, blushed, but everybody knew that, that she was joking. But I think that they had a really, um, a much stronger relationship towards the end of her life. I don't know about, about Camilla, though, because those two truly did work behind the scenes to pit the press against each other and i imagine that that's hard to um reconcile from yeah and it would have been look had at diana, prince harry and prince william i mean yeah, look, look at that but yeah and actually you're right had diana lived it would have been diana versus camilla in the press constantly you know if, if diana was out one day and camilla was you would have had those you know the, the, those pieces in the press who wore it better all of those um, sorts of things. Well, we're seeing it here in the UK. You know, the press love two women that are the sort of, you know, rivalries uh, with each other. So maybe that would have been um, the case. But uh, I, I think you're right. I think that they were friends towards the end. Um, uh, the scene as well by Prince Charles is, is the then Prince Charles's reaction to her, her death. He was absolutely, completely bereft at her death he really really was and i don't think that that was stage managed that was absolutely genuine hey talking of stage managed uh, let's talk about the polo in miami yesterday now uh, i i mentioned yesterday how absolutely lovely it was to see megan and harry share a kiss at the polo that uh, Harry was playing in. It was it was a lovely, lovely moment. And, oh, it just so happened to be caught by their Netflix film crew. Yeah. I thought, I honestly, I'm going to get killed for this, but I thought that Megan looked absolutely beautiful. Um, but in addition to her midriff, her controlling nature was on 
clear display. You know, she was requesting other individuals to pose next to her instead of Prince Harry. Uh, the, uh, like you said, the highly choreographed kiss picture. And, you know, it's all for Netflix. It's all for show. They were at the Royal Salute Polo Challenge at the Grand Champions Polo Club in Wellington. And um, to me, this announcement of these two brand new shows it's it has solidified to me that there's no chance for a reconciliation between prince harry and prince william anytime soon because again now prince william has to worry about microphones and cameras following his brother around and both the prince and princess of wales have been so fiercely uh, private and worried about protecting their children from the outside world as of late there's no way they're going to jeopardize that i think you're right by the way i think that they both looked amazing yesterday when when i don't know whether it was when they arrived or when they were leaving but also uh prince harry in his his, his white chinos and and his, his linen jacket and they i just think that they looked amazing and fair play to megan for wearing six inch stilettos on grass I mean, I <laughs> that is that is a commitment to a new chew, which we know she loves. Um, but you're quite right, all stage managed for Netflix. It's interesting, actually. I was speaking this week um, on the Royal Tea, which is on on um, Talk TV, and it's on uh, YouTube. And 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 I was being asked about the chance of a reconciliation, and what you've just said is absolutely right. And I'll repeat what I said then. Um, how could you possibly sit down? William and Harry, Prince William and Prince Harry and, and, and try and mediate some sort of reconciliation without Prince Harry signing a non-disclosure agreement. How could you possibly do that? Because you're right. Even when they had that meeting after Prince Philip's funeral, it ended up one of the extra chapters in spare. When they try and reconcile, that's what ends up. And, and, and the issue is that any move to reconcile will end up being material for some sort of book, interview or professional victimhood. Well, flashback to the fly on the wall scene where Meghan finds out Prince William's head of communications is weighing in on one of her many lawsuits. She was appalled. She, you know, gasps. She, I mean, it's such a raw moment for Meghan Markle where her guard is down. We rarely see these kind of moments for her, but she is so angry and she is so mad. And she's saying to Harry, basically, I can't believe your brother would do that. Flashback to Prince Harry sheepishly showing Meghan Markle a text message from Prince William after the Oprah Winfrey interview. Prince William is not going to invite that type of chaos back into his life right now. No, because Prince William is uh, in love and loathe, or loathe Prince William. He's about control, very much about control. He's very, very protective, as you've just alluded to. He is not going to allow that back into his life. Uh, funny how you say one of the many lawsuits. I mean, they, they've literally got more lawsuits than, than Meghan's got dresses, right? I don't know. I bet she's got a lot of dresses. Oh, um, I, I wonder. That would be interesting to see which is uh, the one. Now, uh, we've got these two new Netflix shows. Uh, as we say, one is about the polo. Now, the other one is about, I mean, it's about like cookery and lifestyle and entertaining. Yeah. And I can't help but read that and just think, you just want to sell us pet food by American Dead Riviera, don't you? Yeah, it's because it, they say she's going to be celebrating, Megan's going to be celebrating the joys of cooking, gardening, entertaining, and friendship. I think judging by the content of both projects, this is not about fast cash, which is what we usually talk about. I think based on those descriptions, they are clearly desperate to change people's perspectives, um, perception of them. Uh, I could name 10 friends Meghan Markle no longer talks to, but she's eager to brand herself as everyone's gardening girlfriend. Uh, Harry and Meghan are trying to use these projects, I think, as PR tools that will likely blow up in their faces because there are receipts. They claim a lot of things that turn out not to be true. The more they put out there, the more people fact check them. I mean, do you really think that Meghan's going to be out there sort of growing carrots and uh, all of those sorts of things and, and nurturing the garden. It's going to literally be, oh, look, you know, here are some carrots and look at this, look, look at all this, all, all of this fruit. No, I've made some jam and, oh, here it is. And it's just $7 if you just, you know, it, it's going to be a QVC show, isn't it? 
I mean, she got Selena Gomez's, um, one of her production people to do it. So I, I knew, I felt like that was the direction they were going to go. I think it's going to be Megan and a celebrity or, or a Megan and a celebrity chef in the kitchen, just like Selena Gomez's uh, show on HBO, which is really cute. Um, and you're seeing her go, uh, uh, it's very, I know we always throw around Martha Stewart, Gwyneth Paltrow, but um, some of these, uh, these other names, but Selena Gomez has a makeup line. They say Megan's going to launch a makeup line. Selena Gomez has a cooking show, like a lot of the, a blog. A lot of the things I'm seeing also um, goes hand in hand with what Selena Gomez has done too, surprisingly. I think she's going, you know, she is, she's trying to just become a personality, but um, they try so hard to control their image. And s sometimes it reeks of insincerity. Uh, they lack the authenticity needed to maintain the star power that they once did have. Well, absolutely. And I think it's as we predicted, you and I predicted, um, and we did many podcasts, you and I, and I keep saying, and people keep saying we need to do another one, and we've been absolutely dreadful at it, but we, we keep saying, you know, we went, I, we came up with a, a laundry list of, of some of the, the, the tap that they were going to end up selling us and the branded stuff and sort of Megan makeup. And my favourite one, of course, was Arky Wipes, you know, m makeup wipes that they could bring off. But actually, it's it's becoming true. I mean, this is actually true. One of the things they want to hoik us is pet food. I mean, they're actually going to be selling dog, you know, food for Fido. I think it was shampoo and conditioner. For dog dogs? Shampoo and conditioner. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right, few. All right, so it's not going to be it's not going to be pet food. It'll be shampoo and conditioner for your dog. I mean, and and who said that they were ever devaluing the royal brand? Whoever no. said that? Well, yeah, I think that if there are people out there willing to buy it, God bless them. But, um, you know, I, I, I thought it was interesting timing the way that we heard about the new Netflix shows uh, as if once Prince William broke his silence on social media and once we saw Prince George and Prince William out and about, um, you know, looking like they were in good spirits, then this the onslaught of the Sussex PR, you know, comes our way with the deadline article and fun i also want to mention christo that if you tried to share the deadline article um via their website it did not say anything about prince harry in the title it said megan markle to launch to duchess of sussex <laughs> megan duchess of sussex to launch two new shows if you look at their facebook post when the article was originally published it says megan markle duchess of sussex to release uh two new netflix shows harry is an afterthought this is all a pr push for megan markle where where is harry who is harry harry who that will be what it, what it is harry houdini that's who um now is this part of their pr blitz as you say because they've got a new pr team now i mean i say new um most of their staff remain in the new stage because they end up leaving before they've been in the role for very long but they've got this new pr team and and, and this is all part of their blitz isn't it well, I think that what we saw when it came to the polo event is Harry and Meghan wanting to release that they had these two new shows come out before somebody at the polo event said why, you know, told The Sun that Netflix cameras were following them everywhere. And, you know, Deadline is one of the um, one of the publications that they typically do work with when they want to announce something. Deadline, People Magazine, Variety, the ones that cater to them and have a positive tone uh, typically get the exclusives. And so um, it, it's not really a new strategy. Certainly we've seen similar, you know, p content pumped out through Deadline before, but I think that we heard about it aside from them give you know it feeling like it was okay after Kate's cancer diagnosis to continue to promote themselves uh, seeing Prince William out and about I think that also they wanted to make sure that no one else could announce these this show about polo before they did polo and gardening I mean, gardening. good lord honestly um, polo and pot Polo <laughs> and pot okay we've got one minute to talk about Another King Charles story about uh, appointing this colleague, but apparently being duped. What's this story? So um, Garter King of Arms, David White, has been accused, this is in the Daily Mail today, this is an exclusive, of ignoring long-established court procedure and instead using a back channel to secure the King's signature on his preferred choice for a senior appointment of his department um, at the College of Arms. This happened 
and this is, I think, why people are so up in arms about it. Specifically, this happened when the king was in London for his ongoing cancer treatment. And this is when staff, they were specifically told to not bother him during this. This When he was going through the cancer treatment yeah. in London, he's really just supposed to be there to go through cancer treatment in London. Um, and so that's why a lot of people, I mean, aside from breaking the rules, people feel like uh, it was kind of... Um, morally Wrong. corrupt yeah well you know? heads, if, if i was gonna say heads will roll in years ago heads would have actually literally rolled um for that listen kinsey we've got to leave it thank you so much for holding on uh, for us and uh, doing a slightly shorter one today that's kinsey schofield we've got the papers with paul Britton and the big stories coming up next it's talk tv this is talk tv My friends, it's Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Saturday night, that was the woke that was. We've got Pete Barnes, we've got Lois Perry, and we've got the author of Gender Madness, all in London. And we've got someone I don't like. <laughs> morning, got some great tweets this morning on the Right Royal Roundup. We'll get to those in a moment. Kinsey, always delivering. Thanks for your company. It's Christo here on Talk TV. What a grim 24 hours 
for news. We just brought you that update from Sydney. Uh, we'll keep an eye on uh, any developments on that story. We'll keep an eye on any developments with Iran, of course, and that will be a story that will be covered throughout the day here on Talk TV. Coming up this hour, though, uh, we'll talk about the legal implications of whether it's appropriate to sue MI5 when it comes to terror attacks, because uh, that's what uh, some of the victims directly affected by the Manchester bombing. Um, this was the bombing in Manchester Arena. Uh, that's what they plan on doing. So we'll talk about that. The pressure building on Angela Rayner as well, what she should do. Daily Mail, Mail on Sunday, still going for that story. Team Sharon or Team Amanda, we'll talk about that big feud taking place and manners as well, how important they are. Because uh, after our conversation yesterday, it turns out Gen Z are shunning manners, which I think is an absolute travesty. So lots for us to discuss between now and seven o'clock all here. It's live, it's Christo, it's early breakfast and it's talk TV. And Wayne says... Megan will not be the next Charlie Dimmock, says Wayne. Thank you for that. Uh, Den says, whenever I think about Megan selling all that tat, I can't help singing the Only Fools and Horses theme. Thank you. And, uh, um, the only way, this is a very, very fair text from John, saying the only way Megan will ever be taken seriously is when she wakes up with her own father. And... That's what John says. I think you're absolutely right, John. I mean, how can you do a brand about celebrating friends and family and entertaining them when your own father is, you know, seriously ill and you don't have anything to do with him? So there we go. Um, and by the way, thank you, Rona, for your lovely tweet as well. You're so wonderful, Christo, that I set an alarm specifically to listen to your show. And um, I was always up this time before the heart attack. Oh, love you, lovely. Well, I hope I didn't bring on the heart attack. Um, but lovely to have you anyway, every cloud. Um, listen, lovely to have, talking of having how lovely it is to have someone here, that's not how I would describe Paul Britton being in the studio. <laughs> how are you? Oh, well. we got it right, leading criminal defence lawyer. Yes, I was a barrister for the entire last show. Yes, which, which was wrong. No, I did, I did correct, but, um, but it just seemed to stay on the... On the screen. Yes, well, so, so, so sometimes that happens. Sometimes, you know, you've got to try and, you know, got to try and sort of wake them up in there. Yeah. Uh, how are you this morning? All right. Are you, are you, are you, you were all triathlon? Were you triathloning or running or I was tough, tough muddering tough or something? muddering last weekend. So what, what does that involve? That's a 10 mile plus course with 20 odd obstacles now. It used to really? be more. But uh, what do you do in that? You so run, did, you, did you run you through run, mud? Did, yeah, I came 10th which isn't too bad. How, out of how many people? 11? I don't, I don't no. Ha, no, I don't know how many they have over the weekend. <laughs> 40, 50,000 maybe. That's very good. Yeah. Oh, 50,000 people? That's not 50,000 people. Over the weekend, yeah. Oh, so it, it's, they can't, don't have that many people, do yeah, they? Yeah, they do. It's, and you came 10th? There's waves and waves and waves. That's very, I didn't realise how fit, I didn't realise what a fit man I had in the studio. Yeah, the younger ones are much fitter than I am, to be honest. I'm but feeling quite discombobulated I now. I try to keep up. Yeah, this is the first one of the year, so Can hopefully... I drive it? Would I be able to take my car on the course? I think you ought to come. No. Why? Because... I'm not very good at running. It's good fun. I used to be able to run. I've, I've told this story before. Before, remember where I had the the incident yeah. at the Madonna concert. So I can't run now. Get a team together. I'm really bad at running. Take I some, used to take some ibuprofen, paracetamol for your knee. That's very good thing to do. It. I um, I, was, I do a lot of uphill walking now, in the gym. Okay. Because and I've I've got my special trainers. Yeah. For my funny knees. Okay. What do um, they do then? Well, I had to. You you went to the stop the shop, and um, I can't remember what the shop's called. Pro feet, it's called. Right. And you got to put your feet in a mould. Nice. Um, Where's this? In West London. Right. In Marleybone. No, in in in. Oh, there's one in, in Marleybone. I think it's uh, like Fulham area. Okay. And what you do is you. Um, so first you, you walk barefoot on a treadmill and they take a video of it and they do sort of analysis of everything, of your gait and yeah. of your arch and of everything else. And then you put your foot in this sort of funny mould. Mold, yeah. And then they create a specific insole for you to make up for 
because most of your knee problems actually come from your feet. From landing. From where you land on your feet. And so yeah. they make an insole for you so that therefore you're always, um, your foot is always in the correct position and has the support it needs to make mm. sure your knee isn't. So not a whole shoe, just the insole? No, just the insole. Well, they actually, you buy a, sh you buy a trainer there which suits your foot but it's not it's not one of their trainers no. so it'll be a whatever makes and then the insole your foot. goes in and then the insole goes in there yeah and then it means that, that so when i do my uphill walking or i'm going for a long walk around the park i wear those trainers and, 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 I, and how much was it uh it was quite expensive i mean it's it was a, a few hundred pounds at a least hundred quid yeah Just i think more than that no, i think including the trainers and everything well, that's what they are anyway about, you go and buy a good pair of like trail trail trainers like well, these ones, were so what, quid. I think these were like, I think the trainers were were about. I think the trainers were one hundred and fifty. Okay. And then I think the insole thing was a, a couple of hundred. I think it was oh, it ended okay. up being about three hundred and fifty quid, okay. three hundred, three hundred fifty yeah. quid. It was not cheap, but it lasts for a couple of years. Mm. You can go back and you get the insole rejuged. Let's yeah. say give it a bit of a zhuzhing for you. Yeah. Or a new insole. If it's flattening, uh, yeah. Then, well, if you've got to buy a new insole, yeah. then you've got to do the whole thing again. Okay. Um, but it's good. I think the worst thing for runners is when they put their feet out in front of them and they kind of like stride as much as they can. It sends like all the shock up the body. You're supposed to run sort of like... The feet are meant to land below you. It's about getting your cadence right as you oh, go. Oh, is yeah. it? Yeah. I try to work on my cadence and it's always hopeless. God, but, uh, yeah, I used to, but I used to I love running when I was, you know, slimmer and fitter. It's like yeah. meditation. It's good. I mean, just I just always say to people, don't overdo it. Some people do that Tough Mudder. They do it two or three times. In oh, fact, they're In insane. fact, some of them do five loops. And I'm just, I'm not, that's not good for you. Like, one is good, but... I don't like any kind of team sport or any kind of achievement. Yeah. I don't like achieving anything. Well, I started it's, with a something team. Something I'm against. I started with a team, but then they're just all too slow, so... Mm, yeah, I think go at your own pace. And is, then you meet someone the on the way who's at your pace, and then, which is exactly what I did. Oh, and do you? Do you yeah. Did, you, did you make a friend? Yeah, I made do you, a friend. Do you stay in touch with them afterwards? Not really. So I see them at the next events, and then oh, okay, and then they become your sort of event. Yeah, sometimes swap numbers, and you like talk about trainers, and if they go into this one and that one. Yes, yeah. oh, but the thing is, you don't know how you're going to be on the day, so you actually yeah. might be faster than them, or you might be slower than them. So you don't want to hold them up, and you don't want to wait for them really. So. Yeah, so you don't want to be too. I suppose it's like when you've got a new neighbour. Yeah, you sort of want to make friends with them and be friendly enough, but you don't want to be too close to them because you're living next to them. No. I mean, last year, the, last year, the last one of the year, I was in the top four, and we were all like very similar. Like we were catching up with each yeah. other on obstacles, and then because I'm quite good at running, so I could make up the gap in between. But I came fourth in that one. But it's, you, you know, you talk all the way, and you can help each other on certain obstacles. I tell you what, I used to be good at. And again, I'm not good at any of this stuff now, but I used to be really good. The thing that was my thing, and I never knew it was, was rowing. Okay, yeah, upper body. Yeah, I was really good at yeah, rowing in my good gym. Good for you. Good, good cardio. And. I didn't know I was good at it until yeah. I won. Like the gym did a whole competition of everyone doing rowing, and I won in the whole gym. I mean, this is years ago. It's getting the weight behind, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think maybe that's it. But um, oh my god, it kills you. The amount yeah. of times I used to want to vomit on the the rowing machine. Yeah. Um, and then I, when I did my house up, I got you know the the one where you pull it down, the ski erg. Oh yeah, I've got, got one of those. I've got one of those in is, my house. Is it out? I sold it to back to the gym. Okay. Like, there's a gym near my house. Yeah. I was like, I haven't used this in so long. So I went to the gym owner. I said, do you fancy it? And he, he bought it from me. Yeah. They're so, quite good as well. They are quite good, but... but mixing, mixing up cardio, like, swimmers think they're going to be good at running and cyclists think they're going to be at running and runners think they're going to be at like, It's, it's, like it's all different. Show. See, I should present a fitness show. Yeah. I can you, get someone on with it? that, actually. I've got a very good contact with no, someone. I actually would call it <laughs> fitness and fatness. Okay. That's what I'd call it. Just let me know. Yeah, fit and fat. That's <laughs> what we'd call it. two of us on. Um, what have we got here on some of the tweets coming in this morning uh, here on Talk TV? Very sad. RIP the four poor victims. Thoughts with the families, says mm. Jane, regarding Sydney. Um, yes, sue the government too. And I don't care about Angela Rayner. Um, what do you think about this story about the arena bomb survivors suing my five? This is a story in front page of today's Sunday Times. Very interesting story. Hundreds of survivors of the Manchester Arena terror attack are taking legal action against MI5, claiming that the security agency could have prevented the tragedy. Relatives of those who died are part of a 250-strong group 
um, that have lodged a complaint with the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. This is the body that investigates uh, complaints about the intelligence services, but it will be the first time that survivors have taken MI5 to court over failure to stop a domestic terrorist attack, arguing that officers negligence breached the right to life guaranteed by the Human Rights Act. And of course you'll remember that, 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 that hundreds more, um, as well as those who died, um, were seriously injured after this vile individual, who I won't name, um, put metal nuts and bolts into a bomb. 22 people died and this was back in May 2017. But in the months before the attack, there was information that was not acted upon, and that is why this action is taking place. What do you think about this? Because obviously, you know, with the illegal hat on, um, does this set a dangerous precedent that, that, that you can then start suing the authorities uh, for not taking preemptive action before a crime has actually been committed. Yeah, so so this is there's a big human rights element to this. So I'm not a human rights lawyer, so I'll try to not wade into that bit. But um, if if it's a professional negligence claim, then they're looking for or to identify that MI5 had a duty of care. Um, are they professionals? Are they held to that standard? And what were the blunders? What was missed? The, the problem when you read it in the paper, it's it just it's just the story, isn't it? And without scraping well, deeper and looking at I can what tell you a little bit they of have. It. I can tell you a little bit of it. Go on. So when the inquiry was taking place, yeah. a senior officer at MI5 called Witness J told the inquiry that, that some of these vital pieces of intelligence yeah. were assessed as being related to criminal activity rather than terrorist activity. Mm. Um, the nature of that intelligence has been kept secret, um, uh, but uh, uh, the inquiry and evidence was behind uh, closed doors. Uh, but the Director General of MI5 last year said he was profoundly sorry for failing to stop the bomb. And MI5 will have to give the tribunal all the evidence it has about how preventable the bomb was, and then there'll be a hearing next year. Uh, but of course, it could mean that MI5 end up paying out millions and millions of pounds. But isn't it the job? I mean, couldn't this ultimately be quite a good thing? Because it's the job of MI5 to keep us safe. And if they know about people, isn't it their job to stop them doing this stuff? I mean, so on a on a legal side or on a on a, on a more of a, a moral side, like what's right and wrong? Because you've got and... well, well, give me both. Give me your give me where you think it is legally, but give me what your opinion is as well about what you think about whether MI five should be more responsible. So, so legally, they, they they it is possible that they have a duty of care, um, and that they are professionals, and in exercising their role, if there was information that was available to them um, that they didn't act on or wrongly classified which caused the loss of life then then there is potentially a claim there um loss of life tends to attract a very small compensation sum it's really um the the suffering the prolonged suffering is what attracts larger compensation sums um at the so moment so, so if you have a relative in any situation that dies instantly, instantly in a pre but it was a preventable manner. You actually don't get an awful lot of money. There was no that suffering, it's so it's, it's there's no compensation. But if you're left with a, a lifetime injury, so you've lost a, a limb, um, then it would attract much greater revenue, a, a, a monetary figure, because because your suffering is going to last your life. You're going to live with that. But it, that seems a bit perverse because. Why would relatives get mm. more money for a relative of theirs dying? Well, I'm, not, I'm, not in sure, I'm not sure relatives, you know, can get any money. It's like it's it's really. Yeah, but, but I thought that it's, this... it's the deceased's estate. They would be that would be seeking the money. Yeah, so but then that ultimately goes to, to relatives, well, doesn't it? Yes, but it goes to it's the so it'd be the executors of their estate that are bringing the claim on their behalf. But surely it's if they, it's... if they've passed away, if they're dead. But surely it's the death that's the suffering rather than. But people die all the time. Yeah, but if they die from something that was preventable, 
then the death itself is the thing that should be compensated. Mm. Why does the, I mean I understand that there maybe should be an extra payment for suffering. I mean this is this is a this is a real random act. It's not like no, this isn't it's, a random act. It, it's a it's an act of terrorism. It's just not what happens every day. It's not like a a large um, cause of death. It's not like cancer. Well, uh, I, mean, I would describe a random act as. A, I don't, a bolt of lightning or yeah. or a gust of wind that knocks you off your bike and you fall but in a river. This is one person out of 60 million citizens that you need to police. It's literally like a drop in your blood that you're asking, if it was the NHS, for example, to identify. This guy was identified, which is why it's going to be very evidence-heavy. But I think that isn't that the point, though. Um, if... If it was, if he was not known about, mm. and it was just completely out of but the But he blue, was known. He was known. And so his, therefore, and I, his, how can it be called and a his random activity act? activity was classified as criminal activity, not terrorist activity. It, it, Christo, it's just too difficult to know about knowing what this information is. It would just literally stab him in the dark. Yes, but but I I would argue the fact that he was known all along anyway to MI5... As a criminal. ...is, is enough. Isn't that enough? Isn't that what, you know, what do MI5 need? If you know that someone is a criminal or, or know that someone is suspected of criminal activity and then they go on to but carry out a, a terrible, activity, heinous act of terror... Criminal activity you would be bringing drugs into the country. It doesn't mean you're going to go to a stadium and commit a But do MI5, actually... I, I thought MI5 was about the, is, is the security service. So criminal activity... MI5 would get an influx of all sorts of allegations, data that they get in, and it's then their responsibility to sift through that and decide what is terrorism, what is worthy of their department, and what would have to go off to local authorities, the police and other divisions. It's, I think it's they can't, really... they can't, they certainly would not act on every single piece of data that comes to them about a criminal because some of it is going to fall out of their scope. It's, 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 I don't know. I mean, I'd love to know what you think of this. If the MI5 knows about someone, right? As a criminal. As a criminal or as a terrorist, but I, I, let's just say as a criminal or just knows about them. If they're on MI5's radar in whatever capacity, does that mean that then MI5 are responsible and should be keeping us safe? Or does that, that it, or does that become too broad? And does that mean that, that it's an unreasonable request of MI5 or any of those security agencies? I mean, I would argue that I, I would argue that the answer to that is if a person isn't known and randomly carries out a terrible terror attack, I get it, MI5, taken by surprise as much as we were, understood that. But if they know about a person already, isn't that what we pay our taxes for? That the whole point is that if they know about someone, they're supposed to keep an eye on them and stop it. And should they then be able to be sued afterwards? Or does that then open the floodgates in your mind to having to, um, I don't know, retrospectively... I mean, what next? Would we end up in a situation where you're mugged by someone and assaulted by them, but because the police knew about them for another crime, that you then blame the police that you were mugged? I mean, does that open up a can of worms? Maybe you've been a victim of crime and the person was known about already. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call if you want to join the conversation. When we come back, we'll talk some more about that. And uh, we might talk about manners as well. That's all coming up here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid 
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Uh, morning, it's Krista here on Talk TV. Hayley says, is it summer yet? Because you're still drinking tea. Love you, <laughs> says Hayley. I was talking yesterday about how uh, Paul Britton is here, the leading criminal defence lawyer. Um, how you got an ember mug? Uh, yes, I used my <laughs> ember mug. You sent me an ember mug. I used that. Do you? I used that for my afternoon drink, okay. whichever it might be, with a, because I was talking about how I really hate drinking tea in the summer. Tea is a winter drink. To I me. drink it all year round. See, coffee is a is a is a is Can't a summer touch drink. Coffee. You never drink any coffee. I've never drunk coffee. It's like, yeah, disgusting. Why? I don't. I. I do you remember when you had the roses, the chocolates at Christmas, and yes. there was a coffee one? I just wouldn't touch the coffee. See, one. I, I agree with that. I think coffee creams yeah. are the the stuff of the devil. No, I've never got into coffee. Just tea, black tea. Do you not like the smell of coffee? No, I don't actually. Well, actually, I, I heard you. And when it's person. on people's breath, it's like, and they get too close to you, like at, at conferences and stuff, and you're a little oh, bit like, yeah, coffee breath is not yeah, really nice. Well, how person, close do you get space. to people? Well, some people come right into your face and they want to talk to you, and it's like, I won't ask. <laughs> you know, what kind of conferences you're going to? Um, I heard someone say that this week that they, 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 the coffee to them smells and tastes like burnt ash. Yeah, just like mud, like ground, like. I don't know how that could be. I just, I'd love, we, we were buying coffee this week. Yeah. We did a big shop this week again, me and him indoors, and we did the big shop. Don't and... just do it online, just get it all delivered. No, because I like to, I like to, 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 to feel my mangoes. Okay. I like to feel my avocados. Right, don't shout at me. You know, I like to, <laughs> like to have a good it. old feel of yeah. my, 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 uh, uh, aubergines. Okay. You know, yeah. I, I don't like it online because I like to I like to look at my apple. I'm 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 one of the things I love by the way is apples. Right. And but I like a good apple. I like a big apple. I like a good apple. And I like to. It's funny. I just look at the dates when it comes to that sort of stuff. Then you look at their brews and no, have but a feel. meat. I do look at meat. Like I'm like, is that a good <laughs> look at meat? Like... <laughs> You like I, your apples? I, I don't like doubt it. I don't doubt it for a <laughs> second. Like... Not, not, a, not, a, not a fibre in my body that doubts it. Shot by dates. Um, yeah, but also the dates, because I also... Go am, to the I, back. I go to the back. I yeah. fiddle at the back. Yeah. Also, if I or buy... underneath. The other thing, I like buying smoked bacon medallions. OK. Oh, yeah, OK. But I like them... So that's about all, all the fat on. Yeah, and I don't like... But some of them, you, sometimes you get fat through them. So I, I, I'm one of the, I'm that annoying person that takes it off the shelf and goes through and, oh, I'll have that one. And then I go through and go, oh, I'll have that one. And so I do all of that. You can't do that if you get an online delivery. If I'm getting, like, champagne, washing powder, dishwasher, things like that, that, that are heavy, 
or bottled water. I might do that in an online delivery. <laughs> but if it's actually <laughs> produce, no way. I'm not having someone else, you know, fiddle with my tomatoes. I could never buy bacon without the fat on. My partner would go mad. Really? I'll cut mine off and pass it over. It goes, but <laughs> I don't. I don't like fat. Yeah. I don't like fat on anything. No. If I have a steak, I have a fillet steak. There's a lot of things I don't like fat on. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like fat on on on. I mean, the only thing I'll tolerate fat on is myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I certainly don't. I don't. Like, I don't. So my friend Natalie um, loves. Uh, pork belly, right. you know the crispy yeah, fat pork. Which, oh God, no! No, that can be when it's crispy. The crispy no. bit's nice, not the no, not the. I like my dad. Bit. I mean, this is a very Greek thing, but we'll literally eat the fat on a chop. Okay, pork crackling. No. Wow. I don't like any of it. I really don't okay. like like any fat on it. I don't even like chicken skin. I'm very dull when it comes to that. I'm very vanilla when it comes to meat. To meat. Um, so you peel the skin off your your chicken breasts. Yeah, I don't really right. like uh, unless it's something like KFC, okay. where it's been sort of fried to within KFC's an inch. KFC so like, hit and miss, though, it, isn't it? it? Sometimes it's, it's delicious so and sometimes the, it's gross. The, the the concept of it is hideous. Why? What's the concept of it? Well, just like a bucket of chicken covered in covered in f- grease, and st- I've got to have. I've usually got to have had a few drinks. But the skin, on, in that case, tastes better than the chicken. The chicken always tastes yes. a bit so so. Um, Nando's, I take uh, Nando's. I have the breast. Nando's are good. Nando's are good, but yeah. I take the I take the skin off the breast even with Nando's. Yeah. The butterfly chicken. The butterfly chicken. That's what I have at Nando's. The butterfly chicken, and mm. that's lovely. Oh, I like the thighs as well, but they're so expensive. Nando's it used is to be a cheap. Fortune. Do you remember when it first came out? Yeah, it was like ten pounds for the banquet, and, and now, now it's like, like thirty quid. Totally, it's quid. really expensive. It's expensive. Yeah. Do you know uh, the other thing that we like to get sometimes is fish and chips? Yes, Same the other day. Cheap, that yeah. is so expensive. Yeah, but naughty as well, that batter. And yeah, it is. But we got fish and chips the other night. I'm going to tell you how much it was. I've, I've, I've said I, this before. I fried a bit of fish the other day that had batter on it, and I scraped the fish out to give to the cat. There was no fish in it. It was Uh-oh. just all bread and batter. It was like... Oh, no, this is good fish and chips. I will I say that. It. But hang on, let me go through my orders. Hang on. I'm going to right, tell while, you. While you're doing that, I'll go back to the news. <laughs> right, so <laughs> myself and my partner, right, we did it through Deliveroo. Right, we had... Two Hadouken chips. Yeah. And we got a scampi between us. 30 quid. 55 pounds. Okay. Including the delivery. 55 pounds. The, the, the two Hadouken chips was 34 pounds. The scampi was 11 pounds. Oh, I got a tartar sauce from them as well, okay, which was well, £2.95, which is unbelievable. Free. Like the tiniest thing. Yeah. And then the service fee, the delivery fee, the bag fee. They charged me 10p to put it in a bag. I mean, what's is the it, what, what, Is this delivery? This is delivery. I mean, it's a lovely fish and chip shop. Yeah. And it's lovely fish and 50 chips. 50 quid. But 55 pounds? Yeah. I think that's outrageous. I, I actually, honestly, if all this fails, I think I'm going to become a chippy. Not a chippy. But I'm, a I'm not even funny. Restaurants in, restaurants in Central and the West End, you know, two people is 100 pounds. It's 50 pounds a head. It doesn't matter where you go. Doesn't matter if it's high end or low end, they're all like 50 quid ahead. I'm, go- I'm going back now. Let me have a look at some of the others that I've done <laughs> as well. I'm going back. God, it's, it's all Waitrose. That's all I ever get delivered is Waitrose. Oh, Nando's. Waitrose through Deliveroo? Yeah. Okay. Because I forgot some. So so we had. Uh, so you go shopping, you get home, you're like. And then oh. I forgot something. We did that the other night. We went to Waitrose and Sainsbury's the other day. So it's very interesting. You've got to you. make lists. You know, we went there. Yeah. And so we do some of our shopping in Waitrose, like the, the, the salad stuff and things like that we get in Waitrose. Mm. And then we go across the road to Sainsbury's and get, like, the cheaper stuff, because I'm not going to pay Waitrose prices. And they're, they're across the road from each other, yeah. right? So, you know, things like your washing powder and stuff, like that. I'm not going to get that in Waitrose because it's no. more, too expensive. Yeah. So I go across to, to, to Sainsbury's for that. So we did that. Or there's a Sainsbury's that we pass on the way home, so we stop at the Sainsbury's and get the other stuff. So we've got a Sainsbury's list and we have a Waitrose list. And then your entire saving you spend on delivery. With but the then delivery we got fee, home. the service so fee, and the bag fees. I said the other day, so sometimes at home we yeah. have, um, we, we do cook from scratch pretty much every night, but then sometimes we have a treat night. Right. So the other night we had burger night. Right. So we make our own burgers. Yeah. And Gourmet Burger Company do these lovely beef burgers. Yeah. They're really, really nice that you, you make, you grill them at home. 
And I said, oh, we've got loads of them in the freezer. So we bought the buns, the lettuce, the cheese, the, 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 the bacon, everything. Bacon, medallions. Everything to go into the burgers. And then we got home. And I went through the freezer and said, we've not got any burgers. And then I had to get Waitrose after we got home to then deliver the burgers, which was including the service fee and everything else. So it ended up being a fortune. So you're saving by going to the two supermarkets. You probably just burnt up in your delivery. In my delivery fees. fees. Yeah, there is no logic Al to Christo. it. But I'm not paying... I, I'm sorry, the same fabric softener in... Sainsbury's and your carbon footprint asking someone to come out. Oh, I don't care on about a bike that. again. I think that's all a load of nonsense. So you've now. been there and back. I don't care about and that at all. You're not very green, are you? No, I'm not green in the slightest. And now <laughs> they have. I'm sorry, I talk about my bins every week. I must be getting quite repetitive to you. I apologise if you're watching along. But now, I mean, literally, we did it yesterday. We had to do it yesterday. Now they have gone down to fortnightly bin collections. Oh, so now, yeah, yeah, literally, true, we had a big bag of rubbish. So I'm like, right, OK, hang on, get the recycling. And I had to take some recycling out, hide it in the recycling, and put the recycling on top. They used to come every day, do you remember? Yeah, now they now once a fortnight. So I'm, yeah. I, I've had to hide it in the then recycling. It was every other day, then it was twice a week, then it was once a week, and now it's every two weeks. We've got some garden waste. I'm going to have to put it in the boot of the car, take it to the but flat. where is your the council road. tax going? Exactly. Three and a half grand a year I pay them. And the, do you know I t- what? I, do you know what? It's, it's it's a it's a scandal. It's it's where is your council tax and going? Fly tipping because you're getting nothing for it. It's so bad in yeah. my borough now, right? It's fly. Every single street has fly tipping on. It's awful because right? the council has stopped taking stuff away. Stop taking They're, stuff away. The bin away. men have become fussy. Oh, I can't take that. I can't take this. And what's it caused us? You need to give your bin men a fly tipping gift voucher and a foot massage so i i i uh, they they had a sign up right so i keep complaining to the council about the fly tipping right mm. constantly i'm complaining well, you should and they put a sign up in the end i said can you put cameras up they put a sign up don't on my road tip. saying don't fly tip someone's fly tip the sign <laughs> someone's taken down the fly tipping sign and thrown it on the ground so now the fly tipping sign is being fly tipped that's how bad it is it's a low moment councils honestly okay i can't Comment, says Maria in Nottingham, on terrorism and MI5. However, the man who killed the mother last week um, was known to the police. Well, I don't know about this particular story, uh, Maria, so I don't want to really comment on that anymore in case there's anything ongoing with that. But thank you very much indeed uh, for that tweet. And I understand the sentiment that you are coming from. Amazing how they seem to know all who commit atrocities. If the Swiss can sue their government for not doing enough about climate modification, Mm. oops, change, okay, um, not keeping them safe, then surely the security services should be prosecuted also, says says, uh, someone here on Twitter. Thank you. Um, Rotten Politics says, you can't arrest until a crime is committed. Leaves us open to attack from all terrorists after it's too late. Um, After means we die, and the ones left get told not to look back in... Anger. I mean, you, you, they you can't were, arrest. You that's to talk right. about the moral side of this. Yeah, story, I mean, that's you? a good point. They can't arrest until the crime's been done, but they, they can make inquiries. So, you know, good policing is when they think that someone is going to commit a crime, the police go and speak to them and give them, you know, have, have a word, ask them what they're up to, what they're doing, and give them words of advice. Um, but, but, then, but if they're planning on a, committing a terror attack. Yeah. Well, then they watch them. Then they then they pay for someone to watch them, and they are literally surveyed twenty four hours. I mean, you're day, right. It's difficult with this guy. That... But, but, we're, but we're not. We, we, I mean, that, that that then takes us into like thought police. You know, if someone has a bad thought, you know that that's the extreme version of policing people that haven't committed a crime yet. You can't and then we have heads. to be careful what we wish for, because then, you know, one could end up the victim of that sort of thing. Yes. Um, because you have a bad thought about the you know the ultra low emission zone or something yeah. where we're all supposed to be far right. So it's it's you're or some, right. Or someone you bumps into you, and your instinctive behaviour is to either attack or or thump them, but you don't do it because you, you your intelligence kicks in. You're like, I oh, know it was an accident, and you realise what's happened, and so because you had that bad thought. On that note. Um, so do you think that is that the moral dilemma you think when it comes to this so the moral dilemma is i think my5 i i genuinely believe they're trying to do a good job and keep us safe and i i have a it's like suing the nhs like when clients want to sue the nhs i try and steer away from those sort of claims because why 
because I mean the NHS budget is already, you know, uh, disgustingly low. Is it? Uh, well, as in they've got no money to spend. Well, they've got no money to spend, but I, I wouldn't. They've got no and money to spend. And if you bring spend. a case against them, and it's going to cost them another hundred thousand pounds or more, and their legal fees, all you're doing is actually creating the NHS bubble the problem we give the nhs more worse. than we've ever given them, i know the i know but the yeah, problem but they, with the nhs not is they, any money doesn't mean that we don't give them enough but I th- one of the big problems with the nhs is they seem to be curing or going about dealing with things that they probably shouldn't be dealing with um but i, I just think it's just making the problem even worse last week i was on one of the channels talking about the car parks at NA, on the nhs and whether they should be free or yeah. charged for and my position is absolutely they shouldn't be free. You know, we should charge for them. Because... What about staff, though? Well, do you get, do you, is your parking paid for when you come here? Um, my parking's not paid for. No, but I'm parking. not a nurse on a low wage. But but they're, do... on a, they're on they're, they still work. And when you, when you go for a job interview, you ask yourself, how am I going to get here? And one of the questions you normally ask, or I'm asked all the time when I'm interviewing, mm. um, is what's the parking situation? Yes, 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 OK. And then you plan public no, transport. No, 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 but the difference is, in my opinion, and when I rule the world, this is what will mm. happen. Um, I think we need a full root and branch review of public sector work. And as far as I am concerned, if you are going into a profession like Mm. nursing, Mm. like firefighting, like becoming a police officer, any of those jobs that are not only about about working, but also about contributing to society, Mm. probably more so than, you know, a a TV presenter like myself or, you know, a lawyer like you. Speak for yourself. Uh, but no, but, you know, that, that, the, the kind of job you don't go into for wealth, you go into because it's a job that you really want to help people. I believe it is society's job mm. to do a trade with you. And we say to you, right, you are never going to earn a fortune being a police officer. However, you're going to be on a different tax band. You're going to have a higher personal allowance when you're a police officer. You're going to get to the top of the list for social housing. Chris, they, don't, on, they, they, they don't earn badly. I, I mean, finished, you're using I police as your example. Okay, nurses, any of those people who don't earn a load of money. Yeah, you know, you don't earn a. But fortune. they can afford a car, insurance, tax, well, because they MOT. need it because they don't work funny hours. But if they, if a, a car is not cheap, you know, if you buy a car for five hundred pounds, it's not going to cost you five hundred pounds for the year. But when you do the insurance and car. fuel in it, yeah. But the, what, what are they supposed to do? How are they supposed to get to work about public transport? What if so? If okay, so if you work, and that's that is what we should look at. No. We should be turning our attention to infrastructure, roads. Public transport. I'm all caught up in my microphone. And, and if there is a hospital yes. that doesn't have a bus route to it, that's a problem. Well, it is a problem. But and maybe what they want to do, actually, if it, rather than doing that, is look at accommodation for nurses. Well, then you, you didn't let me finish. Let me but finish. But they do let have accommodation finish. for let nurses. Let me finish. Let me finish. doctors. If you become a nurse or if you become a, 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 a police constable or if you become, you know, someone who works as a firefighter, someone like that, someone in one of those public sector roles which you're never going to be rich from... Society says to you, you pay less tax, you go to the top of the list of social housing and you're never going to earn a fortune. Actually, we're going to pay you, you know, low wages. But what you get in return from society is an easy way to get to work. We'll subsidise you with tax and we'll get you on. Well, that sounds like socialism to me. That's not socialism. It does. It sounds sounds like handouts. And when you when you when you when you when you take those things away from people, you, and you put it in the power of the state, then you, you take away their freedoms to, to be masters of their own destiny it's and their the, own about being in the, it's, it's about trading. I would rather... I would give social housing to police, nurses and firefighters any day of the week over okay, and people then, and who then come you'd to have this, this Then you'd have this problem. What if someone goes into that profession for two or three years... Well, then they lose their social And housing. then you've got to get them out. They're not going to you leave. Evict them. That, and then you're evicting the a nurse, someone who was a nurse. Yeah, but the part of the contract is whilst you work for the state... And, and you Christo, they've those... accumulated no wealth, that... so you're sending them back into the system now that's to buy a choice. house. That's their freedom. They have the freedom to do that. You're just creating a problem for them. No, I know you're not. That is the, the trade The best thing you, you can do is and pay also... them reasonably, let them save for a mortgage like everybody else... Buy a house, get on the housing ladder. Uh, where do you ladder. think that pay comes from? It comes from us. This well, is socialism. I think, the, I think the review is of the NHS and what they're actually spending this the money on. It's not socialism. They should be spending money on life-saving treatments 
they should not be spending money on people's lifestyle choices. Well, then That's not a then. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the fact that then you wouldn't have nurses saying, look, I need a 15% mm. pay rise. You wouldn't have junior doctors saying, I need a 30% pay rise. If you said, because you'd have the perfect defence to say to them then, actually, no. I think your, it's a much wider your issue. Your trade with the state yeah. is that you get slightly lower taxes and social housing in response, in, in in return for not having massive wages. You're never going to be a millionaire doing this job, but the state gives you this instead, and it do makes you know, us a better Do you know what society. the best thing that anybody who's got some money in their pocket could do to help the NHS? They could go out and buy a private health insurance policy so they don't have to use the NHS. They don't have I to agree. the NHS. I agree. I absolutely Anyone agree. that has the money to pay for that should be paying for I, that to I, save the NHS. But at the same time... We should be looking at scrutinising what the NHS is spending the money on. I, so I, I agree with is, all of that. It's not just waste, all this stuff about waste on management, being management heavy. It's actually what treatments but are they, they providing. But you can, I, I agree with all of that, but I will still stand by the fact that there are certain vocational mm. jobs in this country that are critical to our infrastructure. They are. And I would rather have a trade with those people that they work... Law and order is critical to our infrastructure. Exactly. In fact, journalism... Don't, don't we is ju want... Free press, journalism is critical. Don't we want nurses that are able to live near their hospital, police officers that are able to live near near the station, firefighters that are able to live how is near it their go, How would station? that work in London, where... It's all back to back. There's no land to build these things well, on. Well, then we need to create social housing. Mm. I mean, that's a big problem anyway. Anyway, listen, we've got to move on. We're going to talk about manners. Perhaps you can gain some when we return <laughs> after this. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to abandon and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Um, another person here on Twitter, morning, saying declining individuals the ability to sue the NHS because the NHS has no money is not good practice. You are correct, Christo. Hear that, Paul Britton? Well, I mean, thank you. <laughs> I respect all views. Thank but you. Poor NHS. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about manners, because we spoke about this a little yesterday, and I got quite a response, actually, on social media, because I was discussing about how um, I still open the door for my mother. Yeah. How I refer... Actually, we started talking about it, because I still refer to people as ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. And some yeah. people object to that. And then, actually, someone sent me the story saying, um, apparently Gen Z, Gen Z, as you should say, but people call it Gen Z, uh, that's if you're sort of in your early 20s now. Gen A is the new one. Um, they're ditching traditional table manners because they think they're irrelevant. So elbows on the table, all of those sorts of things, you know, licking from your plate, all of that. They say that over 60% say that traditional manners are of no importance now. Um, apparently more than a third have used their phones at the table and n nearly 80% do not care about what they described as cutlery politics I, I did a i did a lecture at university mm. and i was told at the beginning not to say ladies and gentlemen that that annoys me. and it threw me and i said so what do i say you just say welcome everybody or hello everybody or you just start you don't why can't you say ladies just and say gentlemen? welcome oh is that because of some people who might it's, be you trans identifying yeah. non-binary yeah and i guess it's safer than trying to include everybody but, but they're non-binary they're not stupid and the toilets there were toilets for everyone um, they're not stupid. Why no. do we presume that non-binary people don't understand? Sometimes, I was, I've said this so many times and I'll say it again. You know, if I, if I see something mm. that is aimed at straight people, mm. I don't think, well, that, I'm excluded, oh my word, how dare they? I just go, well, that's aimed at... at, at, yeah. at or, or, OK, I can adapt that information mm. to myself yeah. because I'm not a moron. And... Why do we presume that if you are... It's an insult. Well, it's it's just, offensive because I've not been included. When well, it's like, if, what's that? I need to be included. No, I need to be included. Welcome human beings. <laughs> Can you imagine? But, you know, I tell you now... And non-human beings. I tell <laughs> you don't now, identify as a human being. Iran have attacked Israel. Yeah. If the nuclear alarm goes off mm. and they and then an announcement goes out ladies and gentlemen make your way to the nearest bunker i bet you i bet you the non-binary people then will say oh yeah oh, oh yeah i'm heading to the bunker well they'll go and then there'll be a complaint later well maybe <laughs> i wasn't asked to go but they're not going to sit there and say well this doesn't mean me i'm going to sit here and i'm going to how be, insensitive i'm going to be nuked by iran to yeah. make the point i hope, right, the, I hope the government have updated the tannoy system to say everybody, everybody. go to a bunker because that is what that is why we we can't go into war because we will end up being you know d d like uh, only the men and women will survive the firing the firing squad will, of the prisoners of war will yeah. bring out they'll say right kill the men first well i, I don't I, I don't identify as a man i'm sorry that's not fair <laughs> you know, that'll be what will happen with the firing squad. yeah because the invaders will still have men and women whereas yeah. we don't anymore how yeah. do, do you mean me what about me and that will be actually what will be it bang. that will be how it will be bang <laughs> it's um so um, apparently um wait what was the question manners okay yes i had so, um in-laws over at the weekend oh right or the other weekend and one of the kids was running around the table playing a computer game and I had to say his name and I was like we're eating like what what are you doing and it's and the kids don't come to the table to eat you know they just play on these tablets for hours like literally that's I, wrong I woke up Sunday and they were on their their tablets five hours later they were still on their tablets on their devices. who are these people I just honestly I have who no idea who are these idea. people you've got in your house and then I saw on Facebook this morning while I was waiting to come on and see you um like one of my friends was cycling down the road and his kids in the background on his bike and he's put a little tagline saying keep them off the devices as long as you can and i'm like the contrast is like he's he's out with his kid on a bike to keep them off the tablets and the devices and then i've got i absolutely almost agree. relatives that are just giving their kids them for five what? hours and i mentioned it to them once and what did they say and i was told i said do you know that the who has said the world health organization has said they should have an hour a day at their age and the dad turned around to me and said, well, they don't have children, do they? 
but, but do you know, can I tell you something really <laughs> I was frightening? like, what? Are can you I mad? tell you something really frightening? I just think it's like a, a digi- a, an abandonment of parenting. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Have you heard of digital dementia? Go on. Digital dementia is when young people, Generation Z, kids... And I hate the word kids, actually. I prefer children, but anyway, I'm using it because you did. Um, when children are on their devices so much... Yeah that um, they don't learn to problem solve right? because their entire time on their devices solves all their problems. It can't be good. So, so um, <coughs> whereas when we were growing up, you used to have to count your change, yeah. you used to have to find your way home mm. because you'd remember a landmark, all of those That's things, right, yeah. what they do is they develop your neural pathways to be able to problem solve. And that makes you a smarter person and a more, you know, a person that's able... And all this lot do is turn to their device. Yes. And what that means is that you're not developing the neural pathways. And it's the same ones you lose Mm. when you have dementia. Right. So what that means is you're never developing the ability. And that's why when you phone a customer service line, you speak to someone who's 18 and you say, oh, hi, I'm just wondering whether you've got this in stock. What? Yeah, I don't understand. Okay, well, do you think if I can move the payment to this device? No, well, we've got we've got to we've got to get these kids away. So from those these children devices. will end up stupid. Yeah, really, well, well, really what about stupid. mental health issues? You know, when they take them off them, they cry. Well, again, they throw a tantrum. I well, mean, that's not good for but them. But also, either. problem solving that you learn by not being on a device relates to mental health because mm. you learn. How to problem yeah. solve. Um, and, and if you don't learn how to problem solve, mm. then when something bad happens to you, you don't have the, the cognitive ability to yeah. be able to analyse and come up with solutions. Mm. So we are creating a generation of really, really stupid children. We really are. I'm and we're ta- screwed. I'm talking of stupid children. Yeah. That's my life. <laughs> I knew he inc- was going to say it. Rude. <laughs> no one wants a barrister, particularly a smart man. What's going on? Are you, are you, are you on which, barrister? There we are. Right, there we are. I said, how incredibly rude. I know. Um, good morning to you as well. Good morning, <laughs> do, Krista. Do you, do you prefer? Do you like table manners? I, yes, I, I do. I, I'm very funny about them, actually. Uh, or live, manners in general. Yeah, yeah manners yeah, in general. So, so and in fact, weirdly, I'm going to ask whether it's actually rude to offer a chair to an older person. Because oh, well, that was a story no. from yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it's just quite interesting, but also just in terms of the way people eat their food, yeah. starting from outside in, how you use your fork. And my Australian friend, very good friend, actually, he always has the fork in the other hand, and I keep saying it's dead. You don't need to spear it. The Americans don't have the same table manners. No, do. I think I have knife and fork the wrong way around. Do you I mean, see I that's use them eloquently, but... That's what you think. Well, I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, but... And, that, and, that, and, and you also have to hold it, and you have to have your finger out when you hold it. Yes, you... soup, soup, obviously. Away from away you, away from you, away and from then you, you tip the, the bowl outside away from you. Outside in, and so when you is go, that how you eat outside in? Yes. So if you, you go, like that as well? yeah, 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 absolutely. So if you go to a very wow. posh dinner where you have multiple layers of yeah. cutlery, one would always start on the outside. Oh, I thought you meant you ate your food from no, the outside no, no. of the plate to the inside. But, no, but, okay. I've, wa- but I've watched people outside. also take the wrong knife, for example. Yeah, um, well, lick the knife or lick. No, you see, not so common. We do the we do the B for bread and the D for drink. So your bread goes... Yeah, on the left. Oh, for goodness ah. sake. I thought you had a mind, an amazing mind, and you have to do this That's to like, you know, where you know, the bread goes. like where you, um, you, know, you reach across to get something. Oh, excuse me. You always do of things like, do. if I'm leaving the table, may I be excused? Yes, or of course. excuse me, I'm, I'm gonna, I've got to go and do something. You, but you know that great adage, manners maketh man. Yeah. My mother, I told you this, and your mother, world. I know your mother will be the same. Oh, she When she gets <laughs> to a door, my mum stands there. Ah uh-huh, yes. Yeah. Well, but I will. But the other thing I do is that I will always walk on the outside of yes. a lady on a pavement, and then some of my friends, the younger girls, will say, "Where have you gone?" Because I'm constantly yes. crossing over yeah. to Absolutely. be on the yeah. outside. And also, as well, the only exception is if you're going somewhere new you've never been before, then you go in first because oh, that's it's hostile the, territory. Yeah, that's yes. that's the pl- and then once you've walked in, you then. Allow the if you're going oh, to the table, then you allow the lady to that's go really first. That's really interesting. So it's all of that stuff mm. is, is what you. But have all to of do. that stuff. So re- you are a Neanderthal. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do wonder what we're doing with younger people and not passing those sort of things I agree. down. I because people, agree. because parents are just letting them get away with it. Exactly. You know where their exactly. baseball cap at the table and stuff like that. Mobile phones at the table. Yeah, unacceptable. Stop? Absolutely. You know. Well, do, do, do you know when I used to go, we used to go shopping in, in St Albans town centre. How very posh. Or, very <laughs> posh. Or, or go to Brent Cross. That's posh. very posh. And my mum would maybe put trousers and a shirt on when I was a child because yes. she'd be like, "You're not wearing trackies. You know, you're, no. you're going out shopping. Yes, you're being right, seen yeah. with me. Yes, you will, you will dress well, nicely." And, and you see older people who will be cutting the grass in a shirt and a tie. Yeah. 
And I, <laughs> I, I love that kind of eccentricity. So, I married someone like that. Oh, actually. did you? When, when we get on a plane, yeah. he wears a jacket and chinos. So, so I would in business definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ab, ab, if we're in business, mm. if on easy jet. Why are you looking at me like that? No, because in business, like when I get into business, I kind of like I'm you wear airways, a tracksuit, don't you? I, I kind of take my top off and like. You oh, take God. your top off? Yeah, literally, like go to bed. Me. Yeah. I, w- I have been known. I, I, <laughs> well, I will change. I will then change into oh, into pajamas. Yeah, but not you when you board the plane. Come around, and make your bed up for you. Yeah, yeah well, so, yes. It's been anyway. a long time since I've been in business. <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, we've got a really busy show. We're going to be talking about these strikes, Iran um, striking back Oof. on Israel. We knew it was coming. The mm. question is, what do the geopolitics say about that? Roger Gawalb uh, will be joining us this morning. David Soffer taking us through all of this morning's papers. The papers are way behind, actually, yeah. the news agenda. So, obviously, they got printed before those strikes. Uh, Patrick Timms is coming in to talk about all the politics. Angela Rayner, that won't go away, will it? That's